Are there any other questions? Yes, who are you, please? Identify, you. Identify yourself, if you would. Thank you. Lisa Finn from Epoch Times. Um, for those electronic uh, problems, that's only limited to the Toyota cars or it applies to all the uh, cars because of the current cars that all use the electronic systems. Um, it applies. Why don't you just, say your name? Uh, Anthony, Anthony Anderson. <clears throat> I've found that there are sudden accelerations occurring in a wide number of cars. Um, it's not just confined to Toyota. Um, most of the major manufacturers have had problems of one kind or another. There's variation in the numbers, but it occurs. I have a couple of questions. Stephen Stock, CBS, out of Miami. I want to follow up, Dr. Anderson. You say, uh, it, depending on the manufacturer, it varies. I know you've looked at some of the data that we showed that showed the graph going up as they introduced these new systems. It, what does that indicate to you that as the new systems are in whatever manufacturer, you see the sudden acceleration complaints go up with NHTSA? Well, well the biggest factor is, of course, the introduction of the electronic throttle. Because the electronic throttle, what effectively happens is that you disassociate the driver's foot from um, pressing through a, a, a cable directly onto the throttle, and you do it indirectly uh, by means of going through the engine control system. So you're no longer in control. What you're doing, in fact, is issuing a request to the engine control computer, and then the engine control computer decides what it's going to do. Now, it's doing that with all sorts of other inputs, from all sorts of other places, and so you don't have this direct control that you formerly did. And, e and EMI can, in fact, interfere with that process between your foot and the throttle. Yes, indeed. Mr. Ditlow, a uh, follow-up question. Are you convinced that this is a, an industry-wide problem, uh, the EMI or the possibility of EMI and not just confined to Toyota? Yes, this is a problem that faces all manufacturers. What we don't know is what the different manufacturers have done about uh, for countermeasures of it. But no one is immune. And that was my follow-up. Are you satisfied with the steps taken by the manufacturers to address this no. problem or even learn more about it? No. Uh, until we have a fully open public forum uh, in which we come forward with information on what different manufacturers are doing, and our choice of a public forum would be an institution like Johns Hopkins or MIT. Uh, and let's drop the claims of proprietary information. This is a problem that faces the country and the auto industry, and we need to resolve it. And for those who would say, oh, this is just some ethereal thing, we can't prove this, I I'd like to hear from anybody on this panel the answer to that, because you've, you've seen the attacks on the gentleman from SIU with Brian Ross. You've seen how this industry is reacting to this. What do you have to say to that? Uh, first of all, I'd like, you, I'd like to suggest that you look at the nine exemplary recalls that I cited this morning, and when there are safety recalls for cell phone interference with vehicle electronics, when there are problems with computer programming in General Motors and Volkswagen vehicles that cause unintended acceleration, uh, then certainly it's an industry-wide problem, and we have examples. And what is important about those examples is not a single one of them was uncovered by the government. They were voluntary recalls by the manufacturers who detected they had a problem with their computer controls. Would any of you like to comment? I can comment on the technical aspects. Um, I've been, as I said, in, in electronics design for 40 years and 20 years uh, specializing in EMI. Uh, what EMI is? Sorry, electromagnetic interference. And this electromagnetic interference is endemic in electronics. In fact, you can't have electronics without you have EMI. Much of the work of an electronic designer is to keep that interference, and it could be internally generated or externally generated, from stopping the thing from working properly. This is this not you know, some vague theory. The uh, IEEE, the Institution of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, has an, I, uh, an EMC society with 4,000 EMC professionals in it, and they just celebrated, a couple of years ago, they just celebrated their 50th annual convention. So that's how long EMI has been a problem. EMI has been a problem for as long as there has been electronics. I'd just like to say that uh, in a, addition to the questions that you've asked, there's another question, which is whether or not 
the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration is going to do something about this. <laughs> and um, I think that the Congress is very concerned about this. There is very likely to be legislation uh, coming out of this whole investigation. And uh, one of the key issues is uh, having a, an overarching um, standard, safety standard, uh, under the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration for uh, electronics in motor vehicles. And I'd like Dr. Brian, uh, Brian Kirk to uh, comment on that, because this is his systems, system, systems electronics is his area of expertise. Yeah, I, d I just follow on from Keith that um, unless we design uh, software systems to be safe, uh, it's just impossible to verify their function because there's nothing to verify against. So design is the issue here. I'd also like to make the point, people sometimes think electromagnetic interference doesn't have any effect on software. And this is not true. Uh, the reason is that now you've got data buses in cars, they're sending messages between the different control computers, uh, maybe cruise control, engine management, whatever. And uh, in my experience, uh, real experience of this, these messages can be corrupted on the data bus by EMI, uh, electromagnetic interference, and some of those errors are not detected, not detectable by the current uh, chips that are used in the systems. And that means that commands between units can be uh, corrupted in some way, uh, which is extremely uh, disturbing. <laughs> um, so that, that's just another mechanism. And I would just say that all these mechanisms need to be looked at scientifically. And the proprietary nature of things kind of gets in the way of the scientific bit. Are there any other questions? Yes. Dr. Armstrong made a reference to, uh, if, I understand, if I remember correctly, Toyota's brake override system not working, uh, yet NHTSA is considering, considering a regulation that might require brake override systems. Do you have a sense whether brake override systems in general don't work or just Toyota's? I should, I should make the point that uh, everything we've been talking about today, although this, this meeting is focused on Toyotas, uh, you could um, replace the Toyota name with almost anybody else's name. It's an endemic problem across the whole of the automotive industry. In fact, it's an endemic problem across the whole of the electronics industry. And this brake override system uh, would be fine if it was an independent system. If it was a truly independent system, then it would be fine. Actually, it wouldn't be fine because you're still relying on the driver. Now, one of the problems you have with a sudden acceleration is a thing we call startlement. People go, whoa, what's going on? It might take you two or three seconds to figure out that the car's doing something on its own. By then, the engine's up to four or 5,000 revs, and you know, the wheels are spinning, and you're, and you're out of control. It's all you can do to hang on for dear life. So making the driver part of the, you know, the safety, making the driver part of the fail-safe is actually bad engineering. But if it's, if it's better than nothing, it's better than what we have at the moment, but it's still not ideal. What we really, when we talk about, when Brian talks about fail-safes in the rail transport industry or the aviation industry or whatever, these are fail-safes that operate automatically. So your response to <laughs> So his response uh, is that you I can see. have a fail-safe um, brake override, but a brake override is not a solution uh, to the problem. It's just a, a preventative of a crash, hopefully, if someone gets their foot on the brake in time. But it's because it will override the accelerator if it's independent. But the real solution is to have independent systems within your uh, electronics in the vehicle itself for your accelerator, for your throttle, and so on. Right now, I think that maybe um, Dr. Anderson can explain with he has a, um, a pedal here about how the uh, electronics are designed, and they have two little chips in there, but they're connected so that if one fails, the other fails. And that's not an independent system. I, I analogize it myself to the, uh, the uh, dual braking system in cars required by NHTSA, which are two entirely separate lines. So if one line fails, the other one works. So you have a two-line system. And that's not the way their electronics are designed in these vehicles today. They're interconnected. Just, 